What's up guys, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School and morganapteaching.com. I've got here another AP review video for you, but if you want to join over 90% of my students in passing the AP test, then check out the links below. I've got writing guides, review guides, instruction guides, and everything I know on how to help you pass the AP test. So feel free to check out my website, and if you find this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, so um, period six is more about industrialism and the populist movement as well as Native Americans, and women, and treatment of minorities like blacks. So we'll start first with the Second Industrial Revolution, which is taking place in the late 19th century. This is a review from um, you know, AP, your own AP world, so there's a little more elaboration on the topic in those videos for anyone that wants to go back to them, but we'll talk about it briefly here. So, Second Industrial Revolution. So the first is roughly 1750 to the mid 19th century focuses on Britain and textiles and steam power. Uh, Second Industrial Revolution is propelled largely by inventions and innovations from, uh, there's still some from Britain, but Germany and uh, the United States. So Second Industrial Revolution. So roughly 1871 to probably like 1914-ish, World War One's a good stopping point for it. So the key components here are the fundamentals of industrialism are already set with like factories and mechanization and um, artificial sor sources of power, non-human or animal sources of power, uh, but they're just a lot better in the second industrial revolution. So one of the things they <clears throat> begin to harness and discover is uh, petroleum, and they are also going to invent the internal combustion engine. Uh, that is the engine that's used in cars and modern day uh, large vehicles. So petroleum, of course, learned how to refine oil and use it, and that is a much fa faster, more powerful source of power, aside from coal, which used to have to heat up, and boil water, create steam. It took a while. Uh, petroleum, though, you ignite it, boom, it explodes, provides you with the energy immediately. And there's lots of oil in the world. Uh, in case you didn't know, oil and coal are both roughly the same thing. It's just dead plants and animals that have accrued sunlight and energy, and then when they die, it sort of gets compounded and pressurized into the soil to us, and then we can use and burn off. All right, and then again, the internal combustion engine, gonna power litter cars, railroads, all kinds of machinery, uh, much more efficiently than steam. So we start using that. Um, another big one is gonna be something called the Bessemer process. Now we can already make steel, we've made steel for a long time, uh, but this is going to um, hasten the carbon process because you basically take pig iron and then you either, actually forget if it's you add carbon or take it out, whatever it is. Um, it's basically iron plus or minus carbon. I forget, again, if it's plus or minus. Uh, but it used to be a complex, expensive, and time-consuming process. But they figured out, if you make these big vats and put holes in them, the oxygen comes through uh, with the heated iron, and it does the carbon process much more quickly and almost automatically. So they're able to make steel large quantities uh, much quicker and cheaper. So you had steel titans like... Andrew Carnegie, the Scottish immigrant, came to the United States. He's going to harness this in his steel mills and pump out steel I-beams and, and railroad tracks and other steel um, uh, goods at a much faster rate, at a higher quantity, at a much lower price than ever. So this is really going to cause a boom in construction. Because these steel beams are going to be used, of course, for massive railroad projects, <clears throat> uh, infrastructure, like, for example, the rebar is now used to reinforce concrete, otherwise concrete can crumble and crack. Um, also, yes, skyscrapers and bridges. So this is why American cities, as compared to like European cities, or any city that was basically built before the early 20th century or late 19th century, uh, they're mostly like three, four, five stories high at max, and then they go wide. Uh, American cities, though, after the second industrial revolution and this kind of industrial boom in the late 19th century, they start skyscraping for buildings. So that's why American cities are more vertical, or any major city that is like a 20th or 21st century city. Like, there's a lot of Asian cities uh, that were <clears throat> created industrially, so now they're very skyscraper friendly, and there's a lot of skyscrapers in them, uh, as well as iron bridges or steel bridges. So this is gonna make construction of buildings and infrastructure much cheaper, much quicker, and much stronger. So we're gonna see uh, the expansion of railroads and cities uh, at unprecedented levels. <clears throat> All right, another one. They're going to learn to harness electricity. <clears throat> they essentially discover you can spin magnets around a copper coil, and that creates electricity. So they use things like dams and steam power to 
turn turbines that spin these magnets around the electricity, push the electrons through, uh, and create it. And electricity, you can send out quite far. You can set up power plants and uh, distribute that power to cities and factories and, and whatnot, and that's going to substantially improve mechanization um, in the United States and in the West and, of course, later the world. Uh, as well as communication, because the uh, telegraph and telephone are going to be, of course, using electricity to communicate, and that's going to allow for instant communication. So we have communication, transportation, infrastructure, buildings, etc. All that is going to uh, expand massively in this era, and that's going to provide a lot of movement, a lot of economic growth to build all this stuff, and of course, a lot of economic growth because businesses can use these things much more efficiently. So now I can communicate instantly. Uh, across large swaths of territory, move my stuff, move people, uh, stay in small areas and buildings because they can go up so high, like you start having corporate offices and things like that. Uh, so the second industrial revolution really, really, really uh, spurs long-term and short-term uh, economic growth in the United States. Um, farming changes too, actually. This second industrial revolution definitely benefits farming. They're able to harness petroleum uh, in internal combustion engine at least later and better mechanization. So agriculture is actually going to boost itself as well. One of the big helpers for agriculture, because they're obviously going to get a lot more uh, steel machinery to help them plant and harvest. But one big problem used to be, if I had a custom made machine and a part broke, I was pretty much stuck. Somebody had to custom make a piece, hopefully, to save my machine. Otherwise my you know $30,000 machine that broke, one piece broke on it, it's done. But with improved mechanization and electric power and, and internal combustion power, they improve machinery to make these sort of standardized parts uh, that would work in, in, in all guns that are made by like, you know, um, uh, Colt or, or, or what's the one? Smith & Wesson or whoever it was, <clears throat> or tractors, you know, and vehicles. So if my tractor or gun, a part broke, I didn't have to buy an entire new gun or a tractor or a car or whatever. I could just buy that part and have somebody replace it. That's known as interchangeable parts, and that is a, uh, a revolution in and of itself, because now I can replace pieces and keep my machine going rather than just buying a new machine every time it breaks down, which is way more efficient. So that allows um, all people to keep their machines much longer and uh, spur that growth further. All right, farming also is gonna get helped out because they have improved storage in roughly two ways. So they can transport it farther because now we have refrigerated ice boxes. So whether it's by train or by ship, I can take meats or grains or whatever, things that generally go bad and spoil quickly, and I can keep them at a very low temperature. So below 41 degrees, I believe is what it is Fahrenheit. So the bacteria can't replicate fast enough to spoil it. So I have ice boxes, which are basically just early refrigerators, as well as uh, grain elevators, which are basically large sealed off silos that you see nowadays on farms that can just store tons of grain. Um, here in the valley we have plenty if you look around, there's big concrete columns that go up like if you're ever driving through country roads uh, and you'll notice these giant concrete you know, columns or buildings going up in the middle of what looks like just farmland. Those are grain elevators and that's where they store their uh, excess grain for use. So all these inventions are gonna help out corporate business, you know, large uh, companies, as well as agriculture itself. So everything's made quicker, cheaper, uh, and in higher quantity. So that, of course, continues that American consumerism where you're using your money to buy products other, people's, other people make, and you have more money left over to buy more stuff, which, of course, spurs more growth, because if people are buying more, they need to hire more people to make the stuff, which means more people have more money, which means they buy more stuff, and it starts that cycle of uh, long-term growth and short-term growth. <clears throat> so with all of these factors, we're gonna have a bit of a shift in the economy. Um, so not only do we have a technological shift that improves production, but we have the formation of, or I could say, I guess you'd say, adjustment of new classes. So we have kind of like a new middle class here, or a lower middle class. So these aren't like the mega rich factory railroad owning bankers or whatever. Those are the really upper class, middle class. Uh, the lower middle class are <clears throat> kind of like white collar jobs. They require some sort of vocational training or education. 
So with the expansion of corporate offices and companies and large scale agriculture, uh, all of a sudden, and, and you know, these networks of communication, uh, we also develop ways like catalogs so people can like look at pr products by mail and send in the money and then of course they mail the product to them. I should forget to mention that catalogs. That's actually pretty huge. Companies like Montgomery Wards and Sears start these catalogs. They send these things out to people in like rural areas and they can look through and see the products and mail the money in and get the product shipped to them potentially. Uh, that's going to vastly increase uh, economic growth. So to fulfill these jobs, they need people to perform these tasks. So lower middle class people that earn more than factory workers, the unskilled laborers, uh, they're going to be, of course, trained vocationally or on the job or uh, through education, these are jobs like clerical workers or secretaries, people that, of course, keep the uh, uh, time logs and paperwork for these corporations and farmers. So clerical workers, most of these uh, first few jobs I mentioned are female uh, dominated. Clerical workers, nurses, uh, teachers, school teachers. With the growing middle class, we have more people able to send their kids to school. So teachers, again, that's these so far are, are female, and they actually still are female-dominated professions. Uh, clerical workers, nurses, uh, teachers, operators, telephone operators, and uh, uh, people that basically back then had to like connect you actually uh, to different people if you're making calls, and they were the ones that would do that. Um, and then we also have corporate jobs, like managers, uh, assistants, and any of the office jobs associated with uh, these new corporations. So <clears throat> there's a lot of economic growth here, and there's a whole new class of people that are trying to emulate the upper class by buying you know, expensive things like watches and nice clothes and things like that, nice shoes and belts, uh, and trying to adopt the fashion. So they're kind of like between the middle class rich and the working class poor. That's where they're kind of like the lower middle class, like the white collar kind of jobs. Not much physical labor, but... Um, it's, a, it's definitely a shift, and we're, we're still sort of in that setup. We still have a, definitely have a working class labor force, and we definitely have a lower middle class of um, trained professionals who have more white collar type jobs uh, that are not ultra rich, like the upper class owners. Um, so this is kind of like how our social structure roughly is still today. Um, <clears throat> what was cool though, for women, and this was an advancement for women, is women dominated these jobs here especially. And this for the first time made women like a, um, I guess you could say a, a distinct economic group. So it gave women an economic identity. At least single women or working class women. Uh, and this created a whole new approach to advertising. So they could actually target women uh, specifically, rather than like just men or just families, uh, single women were actually their own economic group. So if you wanted to target them for cosmetics or fashion or, or whatever it is that they believed women needed at the time or wanted at the time, uh, they would advertise to try to draw more customers because this group actually had paying jobs and they actually had money to buy those things with. Right, so that's going to shift advertising. Advertising is another thing that picks up in this era with posters and slogans and things like that, especially when they get the, the radio going uh, in the 1910s and 20s. Any questions about that? All right, <clears throat> so where was I going to go after that? This, of course, is going to spur on the railroad companies quite a bit between 1865 and 1898. So we've got examples like uh, uh, Jay Gould, with the uh, Union Pacific Railroad Company. Uh, other ones, other famous robber baron, uh, railroad uh, barons, I guess you could say, guys like uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. All these guys, by the way, have like charitable organizations or universities named after them. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so these are some uh, railroad barons or robber barons. And the reason why they got that name, more or less, is because <clears throat> with the capitalist system we were running in the United States in the late 19th century, there was pretty much zero government interference, none whatsoever. Um, so while the market was operating uh, to, I guess you would say, optimize labor and pricing, which pretty much any economist with any brain is going to say is the best way we've ever found to operate an economy, if you don't monitor it at all, 
it tilts towards corruption and tyranny. So some of the early problems in the 19th century was if the government didn't touch the economy at all, we had a lot of very uh, corrupt and collusive activity. So there's definitely, we found a balance between government involvement to sort of keep the market clean, I guess you could say, uh, but there's no doubt that the market economy is the most efficient one for creating uh, prosperity and uh, providing for people's needs. So anyways, here's how we'll start talking about how it was kind of good and a lot of the bad that comes with zero uh, government intervention. So one of the things that they were uh, doing is they would, well, they would buy out the smaller companies. And that's not necessarily a terrible thing, but when you start buying out smaller companies, you start eliminating competition and forming what we call uh, monopolies. Or if you have a few big companies that can't buy each other out, they just work together. That's a cartel. So these guys were working together uh, as cartels or in, in some cases, local monopolies. And the problem with cartels and monopolies, and again, a cartel is large businesses that can't buy each other out, but instead of competing, they just work together to gouge the public. Whether you're a monopoly or a cartel, if you eliminate competition, then there's no need to maintain quality or uh, low prices. So they can jack the prices up, um, not pay much attention to their consumer base because you don't have any other options. You just have to buy their stuff and, or not use it at all. And usually you have to use it. So if there's no government interference, cartels and monopolies just organically appear, uh, which is not a uh, good thing for the economy overall uh, or the uh, consumers especially. So that is one thing that began to develop is they would buy up or bully out smaller uh, railroad companies, which is no bueno. Some other corrupt practices that they engaged in was they worked a lot of times with local um, states or local officials uh, to ensure their monopolies. So ensuring, so they would basically pay legislators and officials in the local areas, whether it was a state or a county or whatever, and those legislators would make sure the only uh, company operating there was their company, whether it was through government contracts or denying the uh, activity of businesses in their areas. So you had a lot of um, what you later call crony capitalism, when businesses are giving money in some way or another to legislators and officials, and those officials are kicking back benefits uh, or contracts to those companies. So we have the beginnings of crony capitalism. And again, that's where businesses offer money in some way to officials and politicians, and the politicians kick back a lot of benefits like exclusive contracts or monopoly rights or whatever, right? So money for favors, essentially. So that was a big problem, obviously, uh, because who loses out if uh, that's happening, if I have a monopoly or a cartel? Uh, consumer. Yeah, the consumer. So all the farmers or whoever it has to use these companies, uh, they're going to suffer because they have to pay the higher price or suffer from the lower quality or, or whatever. So that's, and that's a bad, that's a bad setup with no government interference. That means the government and these large businesses can work together, uh, collude and, and harm everyone. So that is no bueno. All right. Um, also, what these companies would do and were guilty of is of course having very harsh working conditions and pay for their workers. Uh, low. So you shouldn't have to go to your job and worry about dying, unless, you know, of course, you're in the military or police officer, then it's kind of legitimate. But if I'm going to be a railroad worker, my, my, one of my concerns shouldn't be dying, right? And I, I think I may have told you guys earlier, a lot of these guys boozed it up because they couldn't deal with the stress of possibly dying on the job, which, of course, made them worse at their job and more likely to die. Uh, so it was a problem. Uh, but the working conditions were poor, and we'll talk about why those uh, workers couldn't fight for better conditions or wages uh, in a bit. But just know that's, that's going on. I'm hitting on a lot of the negative, but some of the positive, because there is some positive to this, at least the expansion of these railroads um, as they continue to grow. All right, so I mentioned kickbacks. Oh, and also um, the prices, I guess I mentioned that with crony capitalism. Let's say the, capital, uh, the prices became a little overwhelming for people because of the crony capitalism and the monopolies forming. Um, and one problem that created was, of course, small guys, like, little, like me medium to small farmers and, and companies, couldn't really use the railroad because they gave uh, discounts to large, I guess you would say, customers. 
So if you were transporting them a long distance or you were um, uh, transporting a large amount of stuff, they would give you a, a reasonable price. If you were going small distances, like, you know, less than a couple hundred miles, or if you were going uh, with smaller cargo, they would really, really hit you hard with a, a price hike. So price, hike, or short or small customers. So any small to medium farmer, for example, they're going to have to pay an outrageous price to have their goods transported. And they need to, because nobody else can reasonably transport it to uh, the towns and cities for them to make a profit off of it. So a lot of these guys would, of course, hike the prices up. All right, <clears throat> so those are a lot of the uh, bad. However, some of the good is going to be that um, these railroad companies do not all act corrupt the entire time. Some things they actually do to help is these guys, without the government you know, pushing them to do it, by, I think it was 1886, let me check the date here. Well, it might be 1892. It was 1886. By 1886, uh, they're going to standardize rail, railroad lines. So that's gonna mean, independently of anyone else, they're going to make sure all railroad lines and ties the same size and material because it used to be a problem that they have like different sized tracks and cars and ties so that railroads would sort of come up to a new line of tracks and be like, well, we can't even use these guys' railroads to build our whole new one. So by 1886, they on their own, these large companies had standardized the uh, size and proportion and materials of these railroad lines. Uh, and they also, by 1883, and that's three years before, but I forgot it, had standardized time and divided the United States into time zones. And that was important because I had to run my railroads on a time schedule. And if I did not have a standardized set of time, if I was just basing things off of like the sun, that doesn't work, especially if it's across the United States, because of course, nine o'clock in the east is six o'clock in the west. So they formed these time zones and standardized times so railroads could operate um, efficiently. Okay, so those are, those are good things. Other good things, too, is they actually encourage a lot of settlement and growth out west. So, for example, um, they had, what were they called? Sales officials? That's not what they were called. Sales offices. Since the government had granted them so much land and territory um, to build their tracks, they had a lot of real estate that they weren't using. Like, you put the tracks on a good chunk of it, but then you still got, you know, several thousand or hundred square feet around the track that aren't being used. So they were the largest real estate owners in the country. So they were able to sell their real estate for a massive profit. Because these were like, the land was essentially given to them for free or almost free. And then they were able to just turn and sell that to people for a massive profit. So they were able to sell real estate, which is actually gonna be a good thing because that's going to encourage people to move out west because they're near the railroad tracks, so they know that they're gonna be near railroad stops, they're not just cut off from civilization out there. Um, and these guys would give them decent deals on the uh, real estate. So they would offer long-term loans that were easier to pay off. They would also encourage them or support them uh, starting in agriculture, because in the Midwest, the vast prairies um, have optimal settings if there's enough water uh, for agriculture. So long-term loans, uh, they encourage the uh, production of cash crops to pay off those loans, which also increase productivity and supply of grain. Cash crops meaning uh, not just cotton and the stuff you can't eat, but like corn uh, and grain as well. Uh, I realize that's not quite a cash crop, but highly profitable crops. Is this like the Homestead Act? Yeah, we talked about that in the last one, but yes, correct. It, it's part of the Homestead Act, or it coincides, because the Homestead Act is the government giving you land, if you can cultivate it for free. Uh -huh. This is the railroads selling it to you at a decent price. So it's not quite the same thing. But both those are going on at the same time, because okay. that encourages um, a lot of uh, economic growth. People were more hesitant for the Homestead Act, because you're going out without a railroad to the middle of nowhere to set up your uh, you know, family or household. This is safer in many people's eyes because you're near the railroad, near railroad town. A lot of them settle in towns around each other. Uh -huh. um, so, or moved entire towns. So for example, they recruited like entire German villages. Uh, I know an entire town was started by Russian Mennonites, which is a, a sect of Christianity or a branch of Christianity. So um, 
Like, they try to get entire families or villages or uh, people that had common identities to go out and do this together. Uh, and they encouraged families to go, not like single men and women. Although they did do some, we'll talk about that. Um, mostly because they were pretty straightforward in saying, hey, you're going to be kind of alone out there, or there's not many people. So they're not really encouraging you to go out there by yourself because it's going to be hard to find someone to settle down with and you'll be just plain lonely and on your own. So they encouraged entire villages, religious groups, families to go and make this move out west. So as it happens, uh, if you look at a map, like a population density map, you'll see most of the cities and major cities kind of go in a line across the United States in the Midwest. And that's because they've settled near these uh, railroads in the north uh, and in, in the center and along the southern borders too. Uh, now we have interstates there as well. So it, 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 I guess you would say, what's the word I'm looking for? is facilitated by those towns and railroads that were already there. All right, so they set those up, and there's one more thing I want to say. Oh, yeah, this does actually, and this is part of the, um, there's not a whole lot of momentum gained for women's rights in this particular time setting, because they don't get the, the right to vote until um, the 19, uh, early 19th, I think it was 1919, the early 19th century. Uh, but they are gaining ground as an economic group, allowing uh, single women to... Um, support themselves at least much better than ever before. And um, for example, in I think Wyoming and Colorado, you had a lot of households that were uh, single women. I think it was like 10 to 20% in some areas uh, were single women establishing households um, as well as single men too. But they, again, they encouraged families to do it. But if you were an independent or a competent woman, you could get a job and move out west, it was a possibility. Not advised to do it by yourself for anyone, just because again, it's more dangerous you're by yourself, um, it's lonelier, all of those things, but it was a possibility. All right, any questions so far about the settlement and establishment of railroad towns? Okay, cool. All right, <clears throat> so what else? Well, this was obviously a combination of good and bad. Um, and just like capitalism in this era, with it not being regulated by the government at all, is uh, going to have pros and cons. So one of the pros, of course, is during this era, we have rapid expansion of cities, railroads, businesses, and we have uh, a lot of long-term economic growth. That's the biggest pro, and that's a major one. It's hard to point at because it's across such a vast amount of time, but if your society is getting richer and better and suffering less and having less people die of things and enjoying life more, et cetera, like that's a very good thing. But there are some definite cons to this. So uh, pros, and this is a big pro, don't underestimate it, is long-term economic growth. That's a big one. Because um, again, if you expand businesses and the economy and finances, then more people are able to do what they want, which means they're better and more motivated to do their work, which means they uh, produce more or are more creative. Uh, and this is what sort of led to a whole slew of inventions uh, coming out in the 20th century, at least technologically, is because of this. So that's a big pro, don't underestimate it. There's also plenty of cons though. We mentioned some crony capitalism, monopolies, cartels, very bad for everybody, right? This is just straight corruption. Because again, if you don't interfere in the market at all, corruption, inevitably uh, forms itself in the form of cartels, monopolies, or working with politicians. Um, we also have two, more so towards the end of period six, the beginning of period um, seven, we have what's called um, political machines that form. And a great movie to see what this is, I don't know if you guys were watching any other classes, um, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. They do a great job of showing what a political machine is. So it's not actually a machine, um, it's a term used to describe when a particular group has a lot of political power in an area. It could be a state or a city. It's usually a city, uh, but it, it's like a local government, essentially. So these guys operate like they're trying to benefit that city or state. And, and they are, too. Like there's, We'll talk about that. They actually do go out and do these things to make people like them. But they also do a lot of shady things behind the scenes, all right? So what they do is somebody essentially gets elected, and they do a lot of things that look good for them, like they'll help the poor, expand education, whatever. 
But what they do is, since they become the mayor or they own a large business in the area and then they you know, operate under crony capitalism with those politicians or whatever, uh, they fill the city or state with officials that are their friends, essentially. So, uh, political machines, so they, uh, I guess you would say they win office or buy office. And they take important and powerful positions like um, the state or city bureaucracy, uh, police, firefighters, all those public domain jobs they fill with their buddies, who they give benefits to. So who are they going to be loyal to? The people or their, their political bosses? Their political bosses, exactly. So they do their best to publicly make it look like they're helping out the, the city or the state. And they do, right? Like there's a guy named Boss Tweed in New York who you've probably heard about. He's the late 19th, early 20th century. Like he spent millions of dollars. And again, this is like 1,900 millions of dollars. So it's a lot of money. He spent millions of dollars on poor aid for aid and education. He created a ton of uh, city jobs, which is great, right? It looks good on paper. You can show people that and say, oh, you know, this guy loves the city and helps us out and makes it better. But unfortunately, uh, he did some not so friendly things too. Like he gave these positions, uh, again, to his friends, not necessarily people that are qualified or deserve it. So he gave, uh, gave jobs slash privileges to friends. And anyone who was his political enemy, he made sure to harass with his resources. So he would harass political enemies. And this wasn't just in New York, by the way. This happened in San Francisco, Baltimore, uh, Buffalo, Atlanta, all these places developed these political machines with a different person, essentially. So how would they do it? They would do it by, if they're your buddies, any government or state contract for a company goes to your company, right? Um, any fees there are for setting up your company or contracts, uh, they just either waive them or they approve you without really checking it out. On the other hand, though, if you're someone they don't like, they don't give you the contracts. In fact, they might end up fining you and inspecting you uh, much more harshly or, or much more frequently than someone that they, they don't like. Um, they might hit you up with other citations. So they would use whatever power they could to uh, harass their enemies and promote their friends. And that, of course, is not something uh, that a democracy wants to have. That's just straight political corruption. So they would use, again, inspectors, fines, contracts. Uh, to maintain their uh, political power. And again, speaking up against them meant that your business is going to be in trouble. They're going to be inspected over and over, perhaps... Um, fail the inspection even though you might actually be passing it, um, get fined for seeing things like that, not win contracts you deserve and give it to a company that's worse or smaller or whatever that doesn't deserve it. So that's how they would maintain their power. So those are again, all negative things that go along with this, yes, long-term growth, but with no government intervention whatsoever, um, again, hierarchies tilt towards corruption if not corrected. So hierarchies are great, when you're talking about a marketplace and competition for best business and innovation, but you've got to check those hierarchies because if they go untamed, it's just going to become corrupt eventually, like it did. <clears throat> Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, this is going to really propel, by the way, the progressive women later because they're going to they're going to want to fix all this. They they truly detest uh, the operations of crony capitalism, cartels, monopolies, um, and political machines. Got that? Mm -hmm. All right. Where am I going next? So, I think now I'm going to talk about strikes. Yes. Let's talk about strikes, farmers and the populists, and immigration. Then we'll take a break and we'll do imperialism and the rest of period six, which is actually a little bit less than we've done so far. So, alrighty. Um, unions. So, one of the problems for workers, whether you're at a railroad or a factory or whatever, is, I think I mentioned this before, uh, strikes and unions were actually banned. They believed that those disrupted laissez-faire free market capitalism because the government and states, etc., all wanted these markets to operate without any interference. Because again, they believed that was the best way to encourage growth and uh, reduce prices and all those things. So what we have is governments that outright oppose workers trying to raise wages. Because again, 
the government at the time thought that if workers fought for, you know, with strikes or whatever, if they fought for uh, better conditions as a, a union, that would slow economic growth, that would cause, like, like for example, you have a railroad strike, then you can't use the railroads. Then the federal government can't maintain its post office, and it can't maintain its uh, transportation of goods or troops and things like that. So the government many times was against the workers along with business. So in the 19th century, uh, workers were fighting not just their employers, but also the government. So a couple examples of that. Um, Andrew Carnegie, the almost monopolist of the steel industry in the late 19th century, he is going to um, create several, of course, steel mills. One of these is the Homestead uh, Steel Mill, and I think it's Pennsylvania. Don't quote me on that. Um, there's going to be a strike, a union form and a strike, and I think it's 1892. I think it's 1892. If it's not 1892, it's fine, but it's 1890s. I think it's 1892. And these workers go on strike. And uh, to combat it, there was um, a site manager. Oh, I think his last name was Fritz. I can't remember if that's exactly right. But this manager was not a, not a nice guy. Uh, he actually hired mercenaries, uh, known as the Pinkertons, uh, to come and bully these workers to go back to work. Uh, the workers, I guess, threw rocks or something, and one of the Pinkertons shot into the crowd, and they, all the other Pinkerton, Pinkertons followed suit, and so many, many uh, steel mill workers who were striking uh, got shot. So you would think that the government would come in to stop the Pinkertons from shooting people, but no, it was the other way around. The government came in to force the steel workers to go back to work, so the steel mills were still operating and business uh, across the United States could keep growing uh, with the steel mill. So uh, a very big a very big event that really showed, because this got a lot of press coverage, uh, this really showed the people in the United States what was going on with workers and how when they tried to fight for themselves peacefully, I mean, I guess throwing rocks isn't peacefully, but they shouldn't have pe dropped, brought in people with guns in the first place. When pe they tried to fight for their... Um, uh, wages peacefully, uh, they are, of course, met with violence not only by the companies, but by the United States government. So that's really going to shift public opinion in favor of workers. Uh, this happened again, too, with the Pullman strike. I think it's in Minnesota. This was a railroad strike, which had a very similar result. Uh, there was violence used by the company, and then violence used, uh, and federal forces used to put those workers back to work, because I think, I think the president at the time, I think it was Grover Cleveland, he said that railroads had to keep operating so federal institutions like postal service could keep could keep could maintain themselves right so that was an, another example another violent example with multiple deaths and injuries in 1884 uh, one with steel one with railroads where the company and government both opposed the workers all right <clears throat> any questions about that did they use like the sherman antitrust act on any of them uh -huh. or We'll talk more about that with the um, progressive movement. So that's later. Yes. Um, I can't remember what year it was passed. It was around that time. But, yeah, we're saving that for, for period seven. Because, again, a lot of this is, again, showing the, the pros to this. Mm -hmm. You know, the settlement towns, the expansion, the economy, long-term growth. But there's a lot of negatives with the crony capitalism, monopolies, cartels, political machines. And that's going to spur that progressive movement, which is a big opening topic for, for period seven. All right. So... These are the strikes that occur. Um, there were some early attempts, though, in the uh, uh, U.S. or the A-Push <clears throat> test once you, uh, college where wants you to know at least what some of the early unions were. So some of the early unions was um, the, um, we had, there was three. There was the National Labor Union, Knights of Labor, and American um, uh, Federation of Labor. So, I can't read my writing. What? No, no, no. <laughs> so we have um, first in 1866, I think. Let me double check my numbers here. Yes. In 1886, or 1866, my bad, is the National Labor Union. Then we have the um, Knights of Labor. The first two had very similar problems, and I'll sort of describe what those problems are. This is started by a guy named William Silvis. Um, so this is 1866. This was 1870-something. 
Oh, 69. Right. 1869. Uh, both of these sort of fizzle out pretty quickly, and we'll talk about why. And the one that is going to um, work is the uh, AFO. So, this one started by a guy named, by the way, Samuel Gompers. He's a pretty good, pretty clever guy. So problems for the first two, like this, this first one, the National Labor Union died, um, essentially died out when uh, Silvis died, and the National Labor had their own problems as well. So the major problems here was these two groups tried to accomplish too much, and they tried to use people in a way that wasn't efficient. So first of all, they tried to organize uh, labor strikes, but we had a lot of workers just going on their own strikes out of frustration. These are called wildcat strikes. And those are out of hand because those can get violent, they're unorganized. Uh, you need these union leaders to organize these um, and do them like the same day with the same people, keep it peaceful, things like that. And it was really hard for both these groups to maintain that. Um, <clears throat> you also had a lot of very wide sweeping demands. So like generally speaking, if you want change, you've got to do bit by bit across time. If you just say, we want these 10 things and we demand them no matter what, almost no one's gonna say yes to that. However, they might say yes to one or two reasonable things and then you work with them more as time goes on. That's what he's going to advocate, but the first two groups don't so much. So they want like eight hour work days, uh, better uh, working conditions. Um, where else some of their other big claims? Oh, they want like a federal uh, labor board. It was a lot of very large scale changes that were odd because they had pretty much no federal in intervention whatsoever uh, prior to those times. So if you, if you have no federal intervention whatsoever, then all of a sudden you ask for a whole bunch of intervention at once, it's generally speaking not gonna work out too well. You got a question? What's a federal board? So they wanted people, a part of the government, like, a, um, like the Secretary of State, Attorney General, things like that, cabinet members. Mm -hmm. They wanted a whole organization dedicated to <clears throat> protecting workers' rights or managing labor, essentially. Someone that they could talk to to have a, a, an office or department of the government that deals with it specifically. So this is a lot of interventionist changes that are, that are um, uh, they want to implement at once, but aren't even implemented at all. Uh, child labor is another one. Um, but the biggest problem they had was they couldn't organize workers together because there are two groups of workers there's the skilled laborers, ones that have like, they have a specific job, they're specialized. Not anybody can walk in and do it. So like, people that fix machinery, for example, or make specific manufactured goods, like it takes an actual skill, so experience, training, education, whatever, they see themselves, they of course are a part of the factory you know, machine, but they see themselves in the right as separate from the unskilled laborers. The unskilled laborers are the ones that get hired and put in the machinery, or put in the machinery, put in the factory to operate machinery or whatever. It requires no previous training, essentially, uh, or education. So those two groups didn't get along because the skilled laborers felt like they were worth more, and they are, really, uh, than, and they shouldn't have to work with the unskilled laborers. So it was skilled slash unskilled laborers not unified. And for there to be actual change, you're gonna to have to get both these groups to work together. So, one of the ways the AFL, which is started in, let me get the correct year here, which is started in 1886, this one's going to try a different, a more practical, gradual approach. It's not like a let's get everything in one sort of approach, it's more of a uh, let's win things you know, one by one approach. So, we have uh, a focus on wages, because golfers believe that wages were the most important aspect or element uh, to win, and that would fix a lot of the problems for these workers, and then they could, you know, gradually um, adjust things later on as they go. So, he's primarily concerned with wages, and then later with um, hours, and retirements later as well. Not too many big claims at once. But also, uh, he drastically reduced the amount of wildcat strikes through better organization, more organized. And instead of forming one labor union, he, f he formed a federation, which is what, where he gets his name, the American Federation uh, of Labor, is um, 
it's a it's like a bunch of independent groups that work together. So he took groups of skilled laborers and unskilled laborers, formed trade unions with them, and had them operate as groups sort of collectively. So instead of being all in one, there was very distinct groups of these trade unions that would much more likely work together. And this is going to be a much more effective way to approach striking and negotiating uh, for different terms uh, or contractual obligations and changes. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. I'm slightly terrified I didn't hit record when I started now. Oh God, please be recording. It is. No. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't want me to think about it. I was like, I don't remember hitting record. <clears throat> All right. That would be. Is this the one which was like full of skilled workers and was like successful? All right. Hmm? Which one was the like trade, the union that like had a bunch of skilled workers and was like successful though? I'm not exactly sure. It may have been them because they organized them in their own individual trade unions, but I'm not 100% sure about one specific skilled worker, one that was highly successful. It's usually easier for skilled labor unions to be effective because you can't just replace them. Like, if it's an unskilled laborer, they can just get a bunch of rural, rural migrants or immigrants, rather, foreign immigrants, to just fill those spots for cheap. Uh, but if it's a skilled laborer, it's like, you can't just throw in a new machinery operator. Like, mm -hmm. they've got to learn, or repair it. They've got to learn how the machine works and how to repair it, and it's a time-consuming process. So, generally speaking, skilled unions are more uh, effective. For example, like teachers. Like, if the teachers go on strike, like, it's not easy to replace the teachers. Right? You can't just... Like, ah, just throwing anybody in there. Like, there's only a certain amount of people that are qualified to do it. Uh, so it's, it's hard to, to, to manage and deal with. Okay, so we got that. Okay, so we're talking about agriculture now. So we'll do agriculture, cities, then take a break. Agriculture. <clears throat> so, some problems with agriculture. You would think that it wouldn't be problematic since the machinery and ice boxes allow for better um, retention of already cultivated grains and, har and harvested grains, as well as the better uh, growing of those grains. You would think, oh, agriculture must have, must have boomed. And you're right, agricultural production did boom, but the success of farmers did not follow suit. So, what I mean by that is, the massive expansion of equipment increased production uh, massively. So new technology uh, increased production substantially. So <clears throat> this is gonna cause, unfortunately for the farmers, overproduction. And anytime we have overproduction, what happens to the price? Does it go up or down? down? It goes down. That's good for consumers, right? I can buy grain cheaper now. Who's it bad for though? The farmers, right? As a farmer, as a, as a supplier, you want to see inflation. Not like hyperinflation, but you want to see a general um, rise in price over time. However, if it starts going down, that is all bad for you. So, we have overproduction of grains, especially when in Europe they start reintroducing tariffs. So, like, for example, um, in the 1870s, Germany and other countries started reintroducing grain tariffs. So, American grain couldn't just be sold to Europeans as easily. Uh, so then they were stuck with these large surpluses of grain, and they can produce more. So most people's general response is, oh, well, wheat is selling for less, so I should just make more wheat so I can make the money back up. But what problem does that cause? Drops prices even more. Yeah, so if everyone starts doing that, which they do, you're going to have the prices drop even further. So production, a surplus, and a deflation of grain prices. But good for consumer, bad for supplier. Also compounding the problem is, like I mentioned before, railroads, railroads are going to um, really hit them hard with fees. So if they're, not, if they're small or medium farmers and they're not traveling long distances, they pay an incredibly large price uh, for transportation. So expensive railroad transportation. <clears throat> as well as the grain elevators, it was the same thing. Grain elevators would, would charge a much higher price then was probably reasonable just because the farmers had to store that excess grain. So we had grain elevators are going to raise their price substantially as well. 
In fact, these grain elevators and railroads are going to work with banks to make sure that farmers have to use the banks or financiers as a middleman to charge them even more on top of that. So grain elevators and they're going to work with banks. Banks aren't all bad, by the way, though. Um, this is going to roughly, this and other factors, are going to result in the Panic of 1893 and an economic uh, depression for like four years. And a lot of railroad industries and businesses are going to go out of, out of business. So one good thing the banks did is because the federal government didn't have enough money to bail out railroads, they, uh, uh, the government literally asked the major banks, hey, could you buy out these railroads so they don't go bankrupt and destroy the economy? So we had in 1883, like J.P. Morgan, for example, bought out a lot of the major railroad companies, and he actually turned them around. Like he turned them into profitable um, uh, railroad companies again. Uh, during and after the actual panic. So I'm not sure exactly when that stopped, but it's like a kind of a funny-ish part of US history where the government has no money and goes, hey, private companies, can you bail out um, the other companies so our economy doesn't crash? And they actually did, which is, which is a good thing. So we got lucky there, at least. You could, all, you could argue that it was a bad thing because JP Morgan and his bank just got substantially more powerful and monopolistic, but at least they helped save a lot of people uh, a lot of grief. All right, uh, grain elevators, uh, these banks are gonna charge them a lot of money, and that's going to mean, since they're paying a lot to process the grain and store it, and the prices are substantially lower, many of these uh, farmers are gonna default on their payments. So any loans they took for grain elevators from banks or farming equipment or land or whatever, uh, they're gonna start defaulting uh, on mortgage or loan payments. Which means they go bankrupt. And then the banks now own their farm, their machinery, etc., and they're out. They're out a job and a life, essentially. So that's no bueno, right? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, these monopolies are allowed because of crony capitals and political machines that engage in what's called graft, G-R-F-A-T, where these companies, individuals, of course, uh, take favors and give favors to benefit themselves personally, like the boss tweeds and the major railroad companies and things like that, or the grain elevators. So, as a response, many of these farmers are gonna form what are gonna become the last great agricultural uh, political movement. So before they start a political party called the Populists, uh, they're gonna form a collective organization <clears throat> referred to as the Grange in 1867. Uh, they call themselves the, the Patrons of Husbandry or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it is. They're, yeah, Patrons of Husbandry was, was their like, uh, motto. So uh, husbandry, again, is just anytime you're, you're cultivating or growing animals or crops. So these guys work together pretty well. So it's a group of farmers, group of farmers. Um, they're there to support each other, pass information, and just generally operate um, in fellowship um, as a group, a fellow group of like-minded individuals who are working towards a common goal. So that's what their goal was. They actually did several things uh, that were very beneficial for farmers. They're going to uh, win a court case, I think it's Moon, Moon versus Illinois. Let me double check that. Yep, Moon versus Illinois, 1877. Which, 77, uh, put a cap on grain elevator price so they couldn't charge exorbitant amounts. There was, only, uh, there was a max price grain elevators could charge for holding their grains. So set max grain elevator price. So yay farmers on that. They also, also uh, negotiated um, by pooling farmers together. They negotiated with companies for uh, cheaper um, Machinery, things like that, they got discounts. Negotiated discounts on machinery. And lastly, they got a lot of cash only uh, contracts and agreements with the grain elevators. That kept uh, banks from becoming these unnecessary middlemen with which you were required to pay a fee or take a loan from to use these grain elevators. So cash, only grain elevator 
agreements. And again, that cut out the unnecessary bank middleman that charged them interest and uh, uh, fees for paying for, or sorry, engaging in the economic activity of these uh, grain elevators. So now they just go in and pay themselves uh, for the uh, grain storage. The court case is Moon? Yeah, Moon, M-U-N, I believe, unless I wrote it down incorrectly, which is possible, but I believe it's Moon versus Illinois. Regardless, 1877, they won the, uh, the right to set a max grain elevator price. All right, that doesn't fix everything though, because the deflation is going to continue. So, these farmers are very much opposed to banks, as well as monopolies, crony capitalism, uh, that operated with um, grain elevators and railroads against them. So they're, they're very, these are kind of like early progressivists, right? Because progr progressivists wanted, progressivism wanted like to eliminate corruption, in the government and with business uh, to stop monopolies, to add more regular people, uh, or at least the power of regular people to government. Uh, so the populist movement is like an early predecessor of the, um, I guess you would say, uh, later progressivists. And let me try and skip something. If I talk about aid to the poor later, I think I do. If not, I'll just talk about it. Oh, well, there we go. I do talk about it later. They also help lead to this sort of greater call to help out society by helping the poor and deserving poor and things like that. So, uh, <clears throat> what's going to form the late 19th century is the Populist Party, the last major political movement by uh, agricultural groups. So, Populist Party, late 19th century. They're never going to be quite popular enough, despite their name, to win a large amount of congressional seats or a uh, presidential candidate. So they won't really last. Uh, they, they're, they're sort of going to try to work with the Southern Democrats who are also very agricultural. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, they're going to work with, sorry, work with Southern Democrats a lot of times, at least the agriculturally oriented ones, because the South remains agricultural. All right, so let me brief talk about the South and we'll continue talking about the populace. So why would they work with the Southern Democrats or at least the agricultural ones? Uh, because again, the South is largely agricultural. There was an attempt, there were attempts uh, to industrialize South. For example, they gave a lot of tax breaks and contracts uh, to any Northern investors, uh, companies that want to come, come down and operate their businesses and factories there. But what realistically was the case was there was just too much economic damage and lack of interest. So the South doubles down on its agricultural economy. It forms, this is kind of like a mix of industry, industry and agriculture. They form a lot of cotton mills. So a lot of uh, textiles are made down there in the South, local ones. And this was kind of a way uh, to either start or work at one for sharecroppers and tenant farmers who are kind of trapped in agriculture for these large plantation owners uh, to kind of win their way out of poverty. So again, to reiterate from uh, period um, five, if you remember sharecropping and tenant farming or essentially you would work kind of like a serf um, by giving most of your grain to the plantation owner and then keeping some of it yourself. Not really enough, though, to advance your life. So these cotton mills, working at them or operating them, uh, were a way for these poorer classes to try to work their way out of um, this cycle of poverty, working in small-scale agriculture. All right, so the, the South did try, but again, there was enough financial backing or interest from the North to really do it. Uh, there's plenty of free and cheap land in the West and in the North uh, that hadn't been used, and that's where the, the major banks and factories and railroad tracks already were. So it's really hard to encourage the expansion into to areas that don't already have it, um, unless you're making it, you're giving them way too many incentives. And the, the South did their best to give incentives, but they didn't give a lot. So these farmers um, were somewhat aligned to the populace, but again, the populace feared that if they formed a third party and took away from Democrats, which party would be left to essentially take over the government? Republicans. Republicans. Are Republicans pro agriculture? No. No, no they're pro business. So the populists were hesitant 
to really push for their own candidates because again they were afraid of splitting the Democratic Party and just giving the Republicans like free reign in the government. Uh, however, these populists did want several things that progressivists would fight for later. So they really were opposed to uh, corporate uh, corruption. And again, that means through monopolies, cartels, crony capitalism. They're opposed to all that. And they wanted a, a greater, greater voice for um, the little guy for regular people. So there's two things that they came up with or was part of their platform that the progressivists are going to adopt and actually get implemented. So one of those are popular votes. They did not like the fact that the way senators used to be chosen was that senators were chosen by state legislators. So I'd have my state legislators in California say there's like, I don't know, 150, 200 or whatever it is. It was very easy for me as a company, for crony capitalism, to buy the votes of the state legislators and essentially pick for myself, my own company, a senator. And I do that enough times, and all of a sudden, I've got a bunch of senators that support my business and give me contracts or rights or land that, uh, of course, benefit me. That's going to be a big deal, by the way, in the 1920s with the Teapot Dome scandal, uh, which is essentially just what I described. Um, federal officials giving um, land and benefits to companies uh, without the, I guess, competition or say of, of others. So popular votes, at least for senators, right? So not, not state legislators picking them, it's gonna be the people picking them for each state, as well as a progressive tax scheme. Because at the time, there was no income tax. So the federal government did not take a tax based on how much money you made. Uh, this was a way they thought that if you tax at a higher scale, it would help to either redistribute the money that was disproportionately going to the wealthy, or at least make the wealthy not quite as wealthy as they are. So progressive tax means if I'm poor, I pay a lower tax than somebody who's middle class, who pays a lower tax than somebody who's upper class, who pays, pays a lower tax than somebody who's like mega rich, right? Depending on how much money they make. Not how much money they have, how much money they make. So, do you understand that? All right, that is largely the populist one, but again, they couldn't really muster enough support to win two very many congressional seats or a, uh, a uh, presidential candidate, because again, they feared splitting the Democrat, Democratic Party and then just giving Republicans more business, uh, more power to, uh, I guess, advance their pro-business uh, policies and beliefs. All right, last one is the growth of cities. So... Obviously, these new corporations and companies and even farmers, but more so uh, city-based companies, like um, any of the corporate jobs, like you need corporate managers, you need construction workers, you need clerical workers, you need factory workers. All these things are in high demand. So, just like in the mid, early to mid-19th century, the late 19th century even more so, you're going to have a, a large amount of immigration. But it's not just from Northern Europe this time, or, or Western Europe. It's going to be from Eastern Europe with the Slavic people, uh, Greeks, from Southern Europe with, with Italians, and throughout Europe with Jews who are increasingly facing uh, persecution in Europe in the 19th century, which is where we get like that whole Zionism where they're trying to uh, create or win their old homeland back in Israel. Many Jews just straight go to the United States instead for opportunity and to escape the persecution of things like the Dreyfus Affair uh, in France and, and other anti-Semitic. Um, I think in Russia, for example, the Cossacks, which are like the military class, were harassing and killing a lot of the Jews in Russia, so they a lot of Jews left Russia at the time. So we got a lot of immigrants coming in <clears throat> from Europe, uh, including Jewish people, as well as a continued flow of people from China, right? Because China's just not doing so all the time. Uh, in fact, Chinese workers that worked on railroads and in mines were called coolies, because they would come over on like an indentured servitude contract and send money or return themselves uh, back to their families in Asia. Those were called, called coolies. And we also had a lot of Japanese uh, workers coming in, especially in the West, West Coast, uh, to work like in Hawaii and in California. Uh, in Washington. So, many immigrants from East, Eastern Southern Europe uh, as well as Asia. And again, these are not 
Western European Protestants. So a lot of people disliked them, uh, you know, based on their, their pre own prejudices and whatnot. And that's not to say, by the way, these guys didn't also dislike others. Uh, they did. As in, in fact, they tended, all these ethnic minorities tended to uh, form what we call enclaves in cities, where they sort of formed their own little mini town inside of a town uh, that was dominated by their own culture, whether it's Greek, Italian, Irish, uh, you know, Russian, Jewish, whatever it was. Uh, and, they, and if you actually look, it's still this way today, actually. If you look at New York, if you look at a population map, not just a map of the city, but like, it's like a checkerboard of ethnicities or, or a, a line of zebras, like from street to street. Um, so they settled, and again, even today, if you look at the, the population of New York, it's, it's kind of like a, an ethnic checkerboard or zebra. Um, which was good for them and bad for them. So good in that they can have familiar people, but bad because they brought with them a long time, or a lot of time, that ethnic tension that existed. So if I was an Irish person and I go into a neighborhood that's not dominated by Irish people, I was legitimately in danger, right? So there was a lot of that ethnic prejudice amongst themselves and with, you know, uh, traditionally white Americans who are American citizens towards them. So we had a lot of ethnic discrimination, not just by native whites, uh, but between each other. Have you ever seen Gangs in New York? This is a good movie. Uh, Gangs in New York takes place during this time. We have a large amount of like Irish and Italian and Greek ethnic groups. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of law and order. They sort of ruled the neighborhoods um, based on ethnic gangs and fought over territory and all that. Um, obviously, the the um, the movie itself is largely fictional, but the overall story from which it is derived is more or less true. Uh, the fact that these ethnic groups formed gangs and discriminated against each other and persecuted each other and, and operated uh, as such. So, enclaves form, so that's good for them because there's lots of opportunity. But again, the uh, negative aspect is discrimination between each other and by native uh, whites who opposed this. Because again, just like the know-nothings, uh, we had a lot of um, native opposition, native meaning like, um, you know, white citizens that were born in the United States, native opposition due to uh, labor. Because those immigrants are worth, willing to work for so much less. Native opposition to labor. Uh, in fact, the Knights of Labor, that was one of their weaknesses, was they were very, very nativist. They wouldn't include or discriminated against immigrant workers because uh, they detested them because they drove their wages down, which is something they were fighting to raise. All right, uh, but there w it was good in that you had opportunities, uh, economic opportunities, for example, to improve their situation, and there was a, a host of familiar people with which they could protect uh, their culture. But one of the main, I guess you would say, motivations of the nativist movement wasn't necessarily to uh, ban immigration, although they did, they did ban Chinese immigration. In 1862, I think it was Lincoln who banned the coolie trade. In fact, also, we have the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act in 1882, where they just banned Chinese immigration out, all right, outright. So the Chinese Exclusion Act. So definitely some action by nativists to eliminate immigration, uh, particularly with certain ethnic groups. <clears throat> Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, but some wanted just to say, not ban them from coming here, because they're useful um, in the long run, especially for industrialization, but they wanted to just assimilate them into American culture, or Americanize them, much like they had for the Native Americans. So there was much more of an Americanization attempt. So things like learning English, Learning American history and, and ideal, ideals, like, you know, Enlightenment ideals and democracy. Uh, but there was a fair amount of tension, though. Uh, in fact, to tell with the Bible riots, there were, this is actually more of a period, period five thing, but it is in period six, too. Uh, we had some instances of violence between Protestants and Catholics, for example, uh, stirred by the know-nothings. They're known as the Bible riots, so they were like, arguing over the areas in which these churches operated. So you had Protestants and Catholics um, actively seeking out 
and uh, damaging churches and each other. Uh, those are going to be known as the Bible riots. So you, you have some Bible riots. That's, again, not a good thing. But the main goal here was to Americanize them. And uh, in fact, going forward in the early 20th century, they're going to implement that into the public schooling system. So it's not initially there, but again, the goal is they arrive in like Ellis Island, for example, in New York, um, and they're screened to make sure they're healthy. And then they would immediately attempt to do their best to Americanize them by, again, encouraging or teaching them English, American ideals, um, things like that. And with Native Americans, too, they did the same thing. But with Native Americans, this was already a European thing. But for Native Americans, they try to teach them to manage private property. We'll talk about that later after the break. But yeah, Americanization became a, uh, a big program. And again, that's going to continue into uh, public schools in the early 20th century. So that's why you have like U.S. history like this. Um, and we like say the pledge and all those sorts of things, have a flag around a national anthem. All that stuff's gonna pop up in the 19th century and be implemented into schools in the 20th century when they become public, compulsory public schools. All right, let's be sure you're not afraid again. Yeah, um, as long as you know why these immigrants were coming over. They were trying to escape uh, persecution, war, economic depression, uh, and there was lots of jobs available, especially in construction on railroads, cities, bridges, and shipyards. And those were all things immigrants as unskilled laborers who didn't speak English could do. But again, opposed by Native uh, Americans, sorry, not Native Americans, by Native citizens uh, who, again, wanted to protect their wages and drive these, either stop immigration or uh, just Americanize them. You guys got it? Sweet, let's take a break. So let's finish up period. This pen is dying. Period uh, six. Yeah, uh, next weekend I won't be here, but we can do the weekend after next weekend. We'll do seven and eight, and I'm probably just gonna do nine by myself. Um, yeah, I'll probably just do it by myself. It's much shorter anyway, so I'll post that up there. <clears throat> Anywho, so, to period six with imperialism. Imperialism is much bigger for Europe, obviously. They go into Africa and Asia and all over. The United States does its own little bit of imperializing, too. So once Manifest Destiny has been realized, we've settled coast to coast. We've got the territories from Spain, France, Britain, Mexico. Uh, we have our Atlantic and Pacific coast, but the United States essentially wants to keep going. So imperialism. Different from colonialism, right? Because colonialism is where you conquer and... Uh, settle <clears throat> or displace the people. Imperialism is minimal displacement. You're going in to take over an area to uh, run it economically, essentially, and politically, but economically. So operate your business there, sell your stuff to them, right? So for example, imperialism was us opening up trade with Japan by force. We didn't settle it, but we used military force to essentially con convince or force them to trade with us. That was imperialism. So if we are setting up our businesses there, or forcing them to buy our stuff, or taking their resources, that's imperialism. Uh, not so much settling, though, that's colonial. All right, American imperialism. Um, we start, of course, with Alaska and Hawaii. So Alaska is just more so bought from the Russians. Um, in, I don't remember the exact year, but it's in the mid-1800s. Mid <clears throat> and uh, we also go for Hawaii which is ruled by the native people of Hawaii. Um, so what goes out there is we have some fruit and sugar companies, American companies, that operate there. And they're very successful. Uh, they get a bunch of workers from China and Japan in the late 19th century. Uh, they're highly profitable. And they want to access more land and trade more cheaply with the United States. So what they do is they organize a coup in 1886. Let me double check, make sure the year runs. I don't, it was 1887. Oh, she's a little later. Um, so we have a fruit slash sugar company. This is a, an American company, mind you. Fruit slash sugar uh, company forces the government at the time of Hawaii uh, to uh, make a basically a pro-American business constitution. Um, and when Queen Lilo Kalani comes into power and she's very anti-American business, they actually organize a coup to remove her and then uh, 
vote for annexation by the United States, which adds why as a territory, makes it much easier to operate there and trade and transport with the United States, so it makes it more profitable. So again, we have our coup slash annexation by uh, basically American business uh, in 1893, that's 1887. Uh, and that's how the United States adopts or annexes Hawaii as a territory. It's not going to be state till later in the 1950s, I think. Don't quote me on that, though. All right. <clears throat> so that's Hawaii. Another big one is the Spanish-American War. Um, and this is one where we take territories from Spain as we kind of feign our support of the Cubans and their fight for independence, and then we don't really give them independence. So here's how it goes. Um, Spanish. American War, 1898. It starts because there's a conflict between the native, not native, I shouldn't say they're Creole, like uh, Creolos, essentially Mestizo people, Cubans versus the Spanish Empire. Spanish Empire's had them for a long time. Uh, at this point, the Spanish Empire is very weak, and the Cubans are fighting for independence, but they can't quite free themselves from Spain on their own. So, Cuban independence movement essentially is what's going on here from Spain and America the United States has economic interests there they have sugar companies and fruit company type things over in um, Cuba and they want to expand that and protect their interests there so they sort of at least partly support the Cubans because they believe in um, the elimination of European imperialism and colonialism in the Americas ever since the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and this isn't quite as uh, motivated by good morals as, so much as its business interests, but the United States in political interests, the United States does want to support the Cubans versus the Spanish. Uh, again, mostly pro American business. So we sail our boat near uh, Spain, the USS Maine. It blows up and sinks in Havana Harbor. We blame the, blame the Spanish, and that's gonna lead us to eventually join the Spanish-American War. So the USS Maine is sunk, Allegedly by the Spanish. <clears throat> it wasn't by the Spanish, by the way. It was by an internal explosion. Um, but the, the reason why America was so ready to go to war was there was a competition between um, a journalist named, uh, with the last name is Pulitzer and uh, Hearst. These guys are competing for the sales and attention of the American public. Um, this is known as yellow journalism or sensationalism because they would make these ridiculous claims about the Spanish like feeding Cubans to sharks and mistreating them and uh, cannibalizing and all sorts of terrible things. And they were quick to blame Spain for this sinking of the Maine. So uh, yellow journalism by Pulitzer and Hearst really made the United States ready to jump into this conflict. <clears throat> So, the United States joins. Um, at this point, we are fairly industrialized. Our economy's growing. Uh, we have um, an industrial military. We have what would later be called the Great White Fleet. We have a large navy. Uh, and they're going to, at least a somewhat, somewhat large navy. I believe at the time, the American navy was behind only the British and Germans and maybe the French. The G British and Germans for sure, uh, and maybe the French. But one of the bigger ones, way bigger than Spain's. So this is not much of an actual war, it, it's, it's a landslide. The Americans go over, um, push the Spanish out of Cuba, and they also sink most of the um, Spanish military, which is fighting the Filipino people in the Philippines uh, at Manila Bay. So very quickly, the United States is victorious, and they're going to take territories from Spain. They take from them the colonies of Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines themselves. And we don't take Cuba, we technically give uh, Cuba their independence, but we force them to include in their constitution an amendment known as the Platt Amendment that protects American business and political interests. So Platt Amendment, I think it's 1801. Sorry, 1901. And this allows the United States to operate its military and naval base known as Guantanamo Bay. So that is a segment of Cuba that the Cubans don't own, the United States owns it, as well as protects our economic interests there and allows the United States military to intervene in, intervene in Cuban affairs whenever we want. So if we ever feel like a government we like, like a guy later on named Batista, uh, is in jeopardy, 
and our businesses are therefore in jeopardy, we have the right, according to the Plot Amendment, to send the U.S. military there to either collect debts or stabilize the economy. So um, it is a very limiting uh, amendment. This is why it's called imperialism, because we're putting limits and controls on the people without actually settling it ourselves. We're allowing our businesses and military to operate there uh, without settling it, but we are controlling it. So again, uh, Guantanamo Bay is set up. Um, we have um, economic interest protected. <clears throat> and the right for military intervention. So we're going to support some uh, pretty nasty dudes in Cuba as dictators just because they are pro-American business and uh, are essentially bought out or in the pockets of American business. Any question about imperialism? All right. In the continental United States, while we technically own all the territory uh, after the Spanish-American War and settling with the British and the uh, purchase of the remaining part of the Southwest from Mexico later, it's owned by the United States, but it's not settled by American citizens. There's still a large amount of Native Americans in there. So this is going to be what's known as the end of the frontier um, and what is colloquially known or unofficially known as the Indian Wars. And those are going to run from about 1860 to 1890. I mentioned them earlier uh, in one of the previous periods, but this is where this is where the last resistance of native tribes. So if you guys remember, a lot of eastern tribes either assimilated, like the Seneca, and just blended into American society, uh, or were moved. Right? They formed treaties and were removed from the territory to Indian reservations. So we have a lot, for example, the Cherokee. Right, they moved to the Oklahoma Territory. And we have a lot of other tribes too, like the, um, who's the Crow? Let me double check though. I didn't write it down. I'm pretty sure the Crow uh, assimilated as well. So the Cherokee are going to move to an Indian reservation, respect the treaty. We also have other tribes like the Crow and Seneca. The Crow are from the Midwest, the Seneca were from the, uh, the Northeast. Uh, they're going to assimilate right into American culture, become property owners, etc. Uh, but some are going to resist that. Some are going to uh, form treaties like the Fort Laramie Treaty. <clears throat> right, and they're going to try to reform these new territories. This is in 1870, so I'm going to look at the actual date. I didn't write it down, but this was with a <clears throat> tribe known as the Sioux, the Dakota Sioux. And these guys are going to try to uh, maintain their... Uh, their previous lifestyles maintain previous lifestyles. So, uh, tribes like the Sioux, by the way, the Fort Laramie Treaty formed a Sioux Indian reservation in what is western South Dakota now, which worked out initially, but when they discovered gold in the Black Hills, which is that region, white settlers, of course, are going to flood in and cause a lot of problems. So the United States in Congress largely formed treaties with these groups, you know, operated, opened up Indian reservations, which white settlers were not supposed to go into, um, to protect them and form treaties. Uh, but Congress is going to largely end this policy by 1871. There's a couple reasons for this. Um, number one, most white settlers ignored the treaties, especially if something good was in the area. Like, for example, the Fort the Laramie Treaty was violated pretty quickly uh, because they discovered gold in the Black Hills. And then white prospectors just said, well, screw the treaty, I'm going to go get myself some gold. And they did. Right? So we had a lot of settlers violated the treaty. And whether they were homesteaders or miners or railroad workers or railroad companies or people who purchased property from the railroad companies, they were quick to violate these treaties uh, because, again, they were, um, uh, there were economic interests involved and they just didn't really care. And secondly, the U.S. Army didn't really enforce these. Technically, the U.S. Army was supposed to stop white settlers from doing this, but they didn't really care that much, the U.S. Army, or at least the individuals in it, didn't care that much about the Native American tribes and they weren't that enthusiastic about forcibly stopping white settlers uh, to protect the interests of Native Americans. And lastly, many of Native Americans may have initially made the agreement, but I mean, their lifestyles just took them out of those territories anyway, 
or they got tired of sitting in them uh, and being limited. So uh, it was much more rare, but in, in many cases, Native Americans were just unsatisfied or uh, dissatisfied with the agreements. So some examples, I already mentioned the Sioux. So the Sioux, Cheyenne, oops, Apache, and others, these were warrior tribes. So these were tribes that had some pretty, pretty ridiculous practices where they would inflict large amounts of pain, like um, this is in all of them, but in one case, for example, they would drive wooden stakes through teenage boys, like their whole bodies, through muscle tissue and tendons, by the way, not just like, oh, get your skin. And they would hang them on roofs, um, and the boys would sit there until they bled and passed out, and they'd be taken down, dragged out, and they'd have to run circles around the um, a camp while people punched out or pulled out those stakes. And the whole point was for these boys not to cry or show pain or remorse uh, and show them how to deal with pain. It was like one of their uh, transitions to manhood. Like, they looked forward to and enjoyed it. Uh, I know it sounds ridiculous now, but that was one of the traditions there. Uh, and they were, they were a warrior, um, they were warrior tribes. They detested one another. They fought frequently, right? The whole point of these um, initiations were to like sort of, uh, I guess you would say, desensitize them to pain so they could be better warriors. Um, but these groups did technically work together at times, uh, rival tribes, uh, to try to combat the large amount of white settlers. But there's some problems with that, which I'll discuss here. So many tribes actively, are, of course, are going to um, <clears throat> oppose this. They're going to, well, of course, the Crow, Seneca, Cherokee, and others try to live inside these territories and adopt like agrarian lifestyles, which is much more American ideal. Um, the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Apache try to continue their, their old way of life, or at least merge it. So either they would continue to be nomadic and follow the bison herds, or they would try to mix both and be agricultural and bison dependent. But uh, largely warrior and bison dependent. Not the Apache, they were in the Southwest, but Cheyenne and Sioux were bison dependent. Or nomadic. So the Apache were nomadic. So obviously, the, if you set up a little territory, that's not going to work. They're going to have to go outside at a time. So to deal with this, um, and, and by the way, there was a lot of violence between settlers and uh, the Indians as well. So the Indians, of course, fought each other. They would raid settlers, especially more isolated ones. Um, and it was a legitimate fear of white settlers uh, who feared these, you know, random raids and attacks by Native American groups, which, of course, the increased fear and tension between the two groups caused them both to commit atrocities against each other, uh, killing women, children, old, etc., performing raids, whether the white settlers uh, or the uh, Native Americans. So it was just a big, a big mess in the late 19th century. And eventually the U.S. Army organized to uh, inhumanely but effectively clear uh, the Native Americans from the area and make it safer for white settlers. So they wanted to remove any resistant tribes and assimilate any that were willing to, uh, uh, well, willing to assimilate. So U.S. Army policy. From 1872 and onward is going to be one that's more so about clearing the frontier. So they did two ways. They would do it, of course, by force, meaning engaging the Native American tribes with the, for the intent of uh, annihilating them or capturing them or forcing them to submit, and also by eliminating their lifestyle. And you know how they did that? Killed the bison. Yeah. So one of the tactics became to eliminate the bison, the buffalo. So what they would do was they would take their, of course, horses and much more accurate rifles, and they developed techniques like cycling the herds, where they would just continuously shoot them over and over and over to eradicate hundreds in a single day. Like, I'm sure you've all heard of a guy named Buffalo Bill. He yeah. was particularly good at this. And from 1872 uh, to 1876, I think, that might not be exact here, I think over 90 mil or 9 million buffalo were killed. And they wouldn't really use it either. Like, most of the Native Americans would use most of the buffalo for, like, they used to hide for clothes and tents, and they would eat, you know, the meat or feed it to their animals. And, like, they even developed things like they would take the brain and rub the brain on the hides, which would make it dry out faster because there was a chemical in it that they didn't know what it was, but they knew it worked. They tried to use the whole bison, but these settlers that were intentionally trying to limit the buffalo weren't doing that. They would just kill them, skin them, sell the hides for profit, and just leave the carcasses out there to rot. So um, 
they would kill hundreds a day. Uh, and by, of course, 1876, they'd killed 9 million of them, and that effectively destroyed the uh, Native American way of life. Uh, they could no longer follow these herds. They were too small, too sparse uh, to support uh, these tribes. So that's going to be a problem for Native Americans. Um, in fact, it's kind of interesting. There's a temporary large spike in the wolf population because there were so many dead buffalo just laying around. The wolves just come in and, and feed, have a feeding frenzy, essentially, in their population group uh, for quite a while. All right. Um, so, yes, buffalo essentially wiped out to combat the Indians. Um, and also, Native Americans were not organized. So, I shouldn't say they weren't organized. They weren't permanently organized. So you would have these tribes coming together, like rival Sioux tribes or other tribes coming together to fight the uh, Americans. Like for example, at one point they surrounded and outnumbered um, Custard, the little bighorn. Custard's last stand and massacred the U.S. Army forces there. It was a smaller force, but still uh, wiped out. And um, it was like a good victory, right? They gathered for this fight, they fought, and then um, they just kind of disbanded. And then split up, winter came, and they were all split up in their own encampments. The U.S. Army just came around uh, with their technology and food and supplies, just went and started picking off all the tribes that were huddled uh, 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 to try not to die during the winter, essentially. So they're surrounded in cold and snow at night, and then the army would roll in and just uh, wipe them out. Uh, and the Native Americans couldn't really do anything about that. And they're just, at this point, there were so few Native Americans. They, they could not believe how many whites were coming in uh, from the East Coast. Like, it was just unbelievable to them. They lived in tribes of like 50 to 200, you know, and then there's just thousands and thousands of settlers coming through uh, at a time in these large, you know, convoys. So uh, you had, of course, minor victories like Little Bighorn, but again, Native Americans didn't fight in the winter. Um, so again, this custard's last stand. Uh, they didn't fight in the winter, and they just didn't have the population, communication, or resources to combat the uh, U.S. Army. So by 1890, after incidents like the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre, which was more of a misunderstanding than anything. The Native Americans, in an attempt to restart society um, by, under the leadership of a guy named Wovoka, uh, they started the Ghost Dance Movement, which were, was a belief that they could return things to the way they were in that they could adjust to life as it was, the buffalo herds would come back and they could maintain their lifestyle. But the U.S. Army interpreted this as like a mass meeting for a, an offensive, like a military offensive. So they pounced on it. Again, it really wasn't much of a military uh, gathering. There was a lot of women and children, uh, and as such, a lot of women and children were killed along with the uh, male fighters. So, Wounded Massacre, uh, 1890, and, and by that point, and by that point, um, there was really no organized Native American resistance at that a after that. Um, most of the tribes had either died or been become tired of fighting uh, in this continuous cycle of, of death and destruction. Uh, so they either uh, surrendered or assimilated. And again, like I mentioned before, there was a big effort to Americanize uh, not only Native Americans but uh, foreign immigrants as well. Yeah, Americanization programs. In fact, there was an act of Congress that was deliberately dedicated to this. That's what I wrote down here. I did. The Dawes Severalty Act, which of course tried to divide, divide land, I think it's 1887, let me get the right year. Yes, the Dawes Severalty Act. Uh, they tried to do a lot of territory for individual. Indian farmers. And that's in 1887. So that was the policy. Um, either remove them or assimilate them. Uh, and that was the attitude. And again, by 1890, all Native American resistance had ended. In fact, the Census Bureau at that point declared the frontier over. Um, there, were no, there was no organized Native American resistance. It was safe-ish uh, for settlers to move out west and settle at that point. And there was already thousands of people and railroad towns had been established by that point. All right, and this is largely the end of Native American uh, resistance. At this point, there are, there are protected reservations and assimilation uh, um, attempts in the early 20th century. But there's no real Native American tribes operating in resistance to or against the interests of the US government. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so, 
Why then did so many people think it was okay to treat Americans this way, or foreigners this way, or the working class this way by either taking things from them, telling them how to live, giving them poor working conditions, giving them poor wages? Why in the late 1800s was that such a common uh, view? You guys remember? Social Darwinism. Yep, Social Darwinism. So social Darwinism, and again, a lot of this comes from uh, Darwin's book, The uh, Descent of Man, 1871. So 1870s onward, this is the be beginning of the age of imperialism, uh, not only for Americans, but also for Europeans, like Scramble for Africa, Spheres of Influence, uh, British Raj is already going, but <clears throat> this is the big catalyst for um, imperialism. This takes Darwin's ideas on survival of the fittest and the fact that the, the strong survive and it's okay for them to dominate and replace the weak. They applied it not just to biological creatures like in, the, um, in nature, but they applied it to societies. So what they believed was a superior society or civilization, which at the time of them was a Western society. And they believed this well, they were wrong in their belief that it's because of racial superiority. But they were correct that their culture at the time was far ahead of others. They had more money, organization, uh, freedom, uh, technology. So they were actually ahead of the rest of the world at the time. Again, not because of their race, but because of uh, a sequence of uh, events and ideas in Western history. Um, they believed that the superior society, or in this case, uh, race, it was their duty to take over the rest of the world and civilize everyone else. So they didn't want to go and exterminate everybody. They wanted to do more of the Americanizing or Westernizing in their case. So they thought it was okay to conquer areas, forcibly install their businesses or put things in place like the Platt Amendment, because they believed their system was superior and it would help educate and provide for uh, others around the world. So again, they're not like, going for ethnic cleansing stuff that, you know, is going to come down the road with Hitler and, uh, you know, all the other genocide, and Armenian genocide, things like that. But they are arguing that uh, superior societies, uh, it is their duty to replace or even exploit inferior ones, civs or societies. So again, not there to exterminate them, but it is okay to take over, operate their resources, their businesses, and dictate what they do and, and learn. Because they, they believe that that society is superior and it should be, uh, it's their duty to spread it uh, to other people. So that's why you have imperialism in Africa, Asia, uh, the uh, changing in policies of the US Army towards um, the Native Americans, the Americanization process. That's all part of these social Darwinist beliefs that the culture of others are inferior and needs to be replaced. In fact, it's necessary, it's the duty of, of whites to do that. Right, and again, we know now that that's a, a very incorrect racial doctrine, but at the time they thought that. In fact, it was even propounded or advocated uh, by a lot of the professors like uh, Graham Sumner of Yale was a big proponent of this idea. And again, they were in support of Western science Uh, politics, so like Enlightenment ideals, despite the fact that they were imperializing people. Uh, democracy, uh, what else? Economics, like capitalism. All those were things they believed uh, needed to be spread, if necessary, by force to civilize and catch the rest of the world up. In fact, they came up with a term for this later, it's called the white man's burden, that they had to like put the world on their back and drag it towards civilization. In fact, there's a couple political cartoons that illustrate that with them. Um, John Bull of England and uh, Uncle Sam like picking up several different ethnicities, like stereotypical ones, and then and putting them on their back and carrying them up a hill uh, to civilization. So that was the attitude at the time. So they not only applied that, by the way, to other civilizations, but within one's own culture. So we had kind of a hierarchy, right, of uh, of like working class, lower middle class, middle class, and then of course the ultra rich. They believe this was a, a, an okay thing. Now, we know that hierarchies form automatically when you have competitive and creative businesses because we're all better at certain things. Like, you might be a better sprinter than me, so of course there's gonna be a hierarchy of sprinters based on ability. Um, 
What we want to prevent from uh, having these hierarchies is corruption dictating who gets there. Like if you just have parents that pay for you to get a spot despite the fact that someone else is faster, that's corrupt, right? Um, so they believe these hierarchies were natural orders. They didn't account for corruption, like I just mentioned, like the crony capitalism, the cartels, and the monopolies, those sorts of things. But they thought it was okay for the working class to have a bad deal, to have low wages, bad conditions, bad living conditions, no retirement, etc. They thought that because they believed they're only there because they're either less intelligent or less hardworking. They're, they thought they were lazy or stupid, essentially. Right? I mean, there's lots of factors that would force you to at least start out there or potentially be stuck there, uh, even if you are hardworking and or smart. So they believed the people up here were there because they were uh, capable, superior genetically, smarter, um, harder working, whatever. And that it was okay for them to reap the benefits and exploit this lower class, right? And I think most people agree that if you're really good at something, you should have a better reward than somebody who doesn't work hard or, or isn't good at it. Uh, but the exploitation and corruption that was going on was, was clearly a violation of even that view. But regardless, they thought the working class, it was okay for them to be exploited because they were uh, dumb or stupid, essentially, or uh, sorry, uh, stupid or lazy, essentially, which we know is not correct. So they saw it as a justification for first imperialism, and then, of course, working class exploitation. Which, of course, we know we're not correct now, but that's what they thought. That's what drove their uh, ideology at the time. So, that's the negative. There is a positive approach, though, to many of these successful folks. So, Andrew Carnegie is an example. Obviously, his Homestead Act was a disaster, but he did overall have a very uh, a philanthropic or love of humanity position. So, this is known as the Gospel of Wealth after his uh, essay, I think with the same name, by Andrew Carnegie, where he very, very, he was very articulate um, in the formation of his ideas. He essentially preached that, yes, some people are better or more opportunistic or smarter or hardworking than others, and they're gonna be successful and they're gonna be extremely rich under this uh, system, like he was, for example, says Carnegie. <clears throat> But instead of saying he deserved what he got, he said what you deserve to do if you're in that position is to provide support to others, particularly those who are um, out of control of their, their circumstances are out of their control. So the gospel of wealth is going to start a, uh, or give impetus to a movement that's going to turn later to the progressive movement, one that's bent on helping what is called the deserving poor, uh, which they saw as young people, old people people who are injured or hurt or sick, uh, or women, not young men, but like pretty much anyone in those groups, they were willing to offer support or help to. So Carnegie, for example, started Carnegie Hall. He donated millions to library. And again, this is millions back then, which would be many millions if not billions now. Um, uh, an example of someone who's doing this now would be Bill Gates, who's donating millions and millions, uh, if not billions, to charities and, and, and things like that. So uh, this gospel of wealth, again, is aid to deserving poor. In fact, it's your duty to do that. Uh, through donations for education, uh, the impoverished, libraries, universities, which is why so many of our universities now are named after these guys, like Vanderbilt University, Stanford, was, I believe, a railroad baron over here in um, California. So yeah, all these guys are donating millions of their dollars based largely on the philanthropic beliefs of Carnegie and his uh, gospel of wealth. Again, he got a bad rap, especially with things like the Homestead Act, so he tried to sort of save his reputation by donating millions of dollars to, uh, to charities. What does this stand for education? Uh, the impoverished, uh, as well as to libraries and universities. Thank you. Uh huh. All right. <clears throat> we also have here, too, many other people that agree with this, of course. So, people that find themselves in the upper parts, the upper echelons of this hierarchy, find it their moral obligation or duty to help out those who are in need. So, you have the beginnings of things like uh, private charities, like the Salvation Army in the 1890s. Salvation Army. You also have um, 
the Sunday School Movement, which began a bit earlier, but it really picked up momentum here. And I think I mentioned that earlier. Again, that's just where they're educating rural and working class children that on Sundays they're day off when they because they don't have access to educate, education. And it's mostly middle class white women. As well as the temperance movement, which is going to be a big part of the progressive movement, and again, opposition to uh, alcohol, because they believed it uh, wasted the wages of the poor working class, as well as uh, increased occurrences of domestic violence and abuse. Have we got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears> Through <throat> our topics. Alternative economies. Uh, that were opposed, of course, to the uh, corruption of capitalism, as well as debates on currency, and then um, segregation and Jim Crow. But those are both pretty quick, especially the currency, except for the currency portion. Oh, All right, I'll put a link on my YouTube channel, by the way, uh, for Marxism uh, to uh, the period three of Euro and period five of world, where I describe this more in detail. We'll go over it quickly here, though. So Karl Marx, 1848, he saw a lot of the corruption, especially in Europe, but there's plenty in America, that unchallenged capitalism has. Like we mentioned some of it, crony capitalism, cartels, monopolies, exploitation of the working class. And guys like Marx, Marx and many of the leftist thinkers, they rightfully come to the defense of people that are being exploited. Right? That's one of the big, one of the big motivating factors and draws of left-minded thinkers. Right? And they have a point. You know, they have a point when there is corruption in these hierarchies and people are being exploited and, and, and forcibly kept down. So, um, while this theory, of course, ends up being disastrous when it actually applied, like every time we've tried communism, it's resulted in millions of death and economic loss and all sorts of corruption. But the idea behind it was overall philanthropic. So, Marx and Engels. So, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, 1848 write about the Communist Manifesto. And to sum it up, they believe the problem was people were competing over private property. So they looked back in history, they saw masters and slaves quarreling. They saw patricians and plebeians in Roman society quarreling over who owned what and how much they owned. They saw uh, peasants or serfs and nobles uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages. And now in the Industrial Era, they saw the middle class, the factory owners, bankers, ba uh, 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 landowners, quarreling and fighting with these middle class workers who are, or sorry, working class workers who are fighting for better conditions and pay. So he's like, there's all sorts of historical struggles that can be divided into, you know, eras, eras of, of human history. And um, he saw the problem as private property. He's like, well, the problem is they're fighting over private property. So potentially to get rid of this problem and make human society more harmonious would be to eliminate private property uh, and have public or shared ownership, where people work to their strengths to the benefit of others. There's like a quote, like, I can't remember exactly what the quote goes, something along the lines of like, everyone has their own skills, so they should utilize those skills to benefit others, right? So his goal was to eliminate private property, property, which he saw as the fundamental problem that caused much of the conflict, exploitation, and discrimination caused by these um, hierarchies. Now again, it's way oversimplified. Whether it's a, a right-wing or a left-wing idea, if anyone ever says the problem with the world is like one to six simple things, they are wrong. The world is way more complicated than that. There's way too many factors. Um, and again, we have, I don't know what history people look at, but we have tried purely socialist Marxist um, states and even small-scale, like you know, cities and communes uh, it just never works. It ends in math, death, exploitation, and economic loss every single time. So, heart's in the right place, but the idea just does not actually function and play out. And again, there's tons of examples. Maoist China, uh, Pol Pot's Cambodia, any utopian society. In fact, they just tried some with Panera Bread, where uh, the last one went out of business, where they tried this system of only pay if you can pay sort of thing. Um, and so it, it was a disaster. Um, we had, they had people coming in just getting free food um, and people that, these were just people that wanted free food and the people that they really wanted to help, the poor, were too humiliated to go in and get free food when others were paying for it. So like, it was a, it was a mess. So anytime we've ever tried something like this, while it, it would just be wonderful to work that way, it just has, 
been a disaster. Again, Stalinist uh, Soviet Union, um, any, any communist puppet state in East, Eastern Europe ever that existed, uh, like Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, uh, I already mentioned Mao's China, C Cambodia, Venezuela, Cuba, all those have been economic and humanitarian disasters. Um, yeah, it's just been a mess. So anyways, let me private property, and you believe there's three phases. There was number one, the revolutionary phase, where the working class rose up and violently took the means of production of private property from the middle class. And again, that's where they take the lands, the factories, the mines, all that stuff, and hold it themselves. <clears throat> working class sees private property. All right. Once that working class holds it, we have a temporary socialist phase, which the uh, government's run by the working class, and they redistribute wealth and land. This is the phase that they've gotten stuck in every time, and it's just totally destroyed civilization, or at least their individual states. And lastly, the idea is they're supposed to, during the socialist phase, of course, distribute things equally uh, within the nation, and promote revolutions in other nations with the overall goal of the communist phase, where there are no borders, just communal syndicates that work together without anybody owning or operating anything, or sorry, without anybody owning anything, but operating and sharing it together based on their talents and, and needs. So no borders slash world communes, essentially. All right, be lovely if that's how it works. It just, it just really doesn't. Uh, the best system we've ever found for increasing prosperity, happiness, economic growth is using the free market system, which results in hierarchies, of course, but finding ways to make sure those hierarchies don't become corrupt. So it, it becomes a competence hierarchy of like, oh, you're the best, you're, you're earning this, not a power or or dominance hierarchy where crony capitalism, cartels, monopolies, political machines uh, impact your placement and position or mobility on that hierarchy. By the way, every time the system's been implemented, there's also been a hierarchy. Um, it just, it seems inevitable. So our best approach so far has been to use the free market system and try to make sure that it is a competence hierarchy, not a, a power or dominance hierarchy that's tilted by corruption. All right, <clears throat> still completely imperfect, but so far the best we have. All righty, so another alternate theory that didn't really get much momentum, but a guy named Henry George, obviously this is an entirely different economic system where you just reject free market capitalism completely and change society completely. However, a guy named Henry George thought of an idea that doesn't revamp all of society. He believed that um, a lot of people exploited and made money off of real estate, speculation. They'd go in, get cheap land, do nothing to it, and wait for that value to rise. Like, they would go in really early, the speculators, they'd go buy up land from the railroad companies and just wait for other people to join out and settle. That land becomes worth more, and they sell it at an incredibly high price. Did they ever cultivate the land or make it better? No. No, they just bought it and waited for it to wait, you know, rise in price. So... He believes since they're not working, they should heavily tax uh, speculators. And that would, of course, provide the, um, the federal government with a lot more tax income. And that way, uh, it could help alleviate some of these inequalities uh, in the uh, hierarchies of the free market. <clears throat> Again, a big part of the progressive movement <clears throat> is trying to reduce the corruption of these uh, free market hierarchies that form. And the, the policies have been pretty successful, at least many of them, not all of them, but many of them, like antitrust organizations, things like that have been uh, overall good. <clears throat> so um, those are two of the main alternative theories. However, there was also a debate on how to stabilize the economy because the rapid growth and deflation in uh, agriculture caused, like I mentioned, a sort of a depression in, in 1893 called the Panic of 1893. Lasted four years. It was a major problem. Um, 
People correctly blamed uh, monopolies, cartels, and political corruption for contributing, contributing to it, as well as monetary policies that were not effective. So there's two basic approaches here. Either Americans supported printed money, which is of course what we use now, the greenbacks essentially, in fact there's a greenback party for 1874. <clears throat> 1874. They were pro-printed money because they saw in the, in the Civil War the uh, greenback money was printed by the North and it worked as a currency, it stabilized the currency, allowed people to uh, accrue more money, inflation occurred, like healthy inflation, prices rising, uh, allowed people to pay off debts more easily, as well as it allowed them to um, uh, make more money. <sighs> Controlled inflation is a good thing. Here's an example. If I buy a house right now in California for $400,000, uh, my monthly mortgage payment's gonna be like, um, if I have a small down payment, it's gonna be like $2,500 a month, something like that. All right, that's a lot of money. However, that's a fixed amount. So if I fast forward 10, 20 years from now, um, I'm still paying $2,500 a month, except because of inflation, instead of maybe making $100,000 a year, now I'm making $200,000 a year because of that slow, progressive inflation. Is it easier if I have $200,000 to pay $2,500 a month for my mortgage? It's way easier, right? So it makes it easier to pay off debts. And farmers got in trouble because they had deflation, right? They had that fixed payment, but they made less money. So they couldn't make those payments back. So the Greenback Party was pro-printed money because it raised the money supply as well as um, allowed for inflation plus healthy inflation. However, many Americans at the time did not trust paper money. Because paper money, if my, okay, for example, let's say the US government fails and nobody starts and everyone stops using um, American dollars. Those are basically just bank notes for the Federal Reserve, right? Those are worthless now. So I have $200,000. Do, do I have $200,000 now? No, because nobody's taking my, my, my money. However, what if I had $200,000 worth of gold? Would I be able to take that to other countries and use it, even if the US economy crashed? Yeah. yeah. I would, right? So a lot of people, this is the Greenback Party. They're, of course, supporting Greenback money, uh, increasing the money supply through the printing of money. Uh, there were others that believed solely in using gold and silver bullion, because again, you can use that anywhere, regardless of the bank or government or whatever. So for example, we had, the, I think it was the Sherman Silver, Purchase Act? Let me get the name here. Yes, Sherman Silver Purchase Act. So this is where the, the supporters of paper money lost. Silver Purchase Act, 1890. Uh, this is gonna require the US Treasury to purchase silver every single year, like millions of dollars in silver. Because people don't trust the printed money. They think the government and people should be using silver or gold because that is trusted uh, currency or inflation. The only problem is you can only purchase so much silver at once. So if my economy is dependent on how much silver or gold I have, if I don't get very much gold or silver, does my money supply increase? No. No. And that usually results in wage deflation or stagnation. And what you want is healthy inflation. Uh, so people that, this is going to be a view that really dies out. But people that believe that you're supposed to have a monetary policy that's dominated by silver and gold, uh, it's much slower economic growth. But again, the problem with currency is, as Germany's in a final 1920s, if you print too much, you have hyperinflation, which makes your money worthless. Um, so it's definitely a balance. But this was a policy at the time pursued by most Republicans and Democrats. So it was really hard for rival uh, political parties like the Greenback Party uh, to oppose that. So, the monetary policy and the ideas around it are going to remain divided as some promote printed money to increase inflation and some promote gold and silver uh, exchanges to reduce inflation and have a trusted currency. But again, we sort of merged the two in the 20th century and then in 1971, we just eliminated this completely. Now we just print money. So you'll notice if you look at a graph, US um, uh, dollar value or inflation, has uh, 
uh, really the, the value has decreased because the inflation of the American dollar has rapidly increased since the 1970s. Because there's no limit, you just print it. Here it is, you can create money, <clears throat> which has been problematic. But I'm sure they'll bite us in the ass later, but we're okay for now. All right, which by the way, means it's probably a good idea to not put all of your wealth into paper money, but have some of it distributed into other things like assets, gold, silver, companies, real estate, whatever, stocks even. That usually keeps pace uh, with inflation. All right, any questions about the uh, currency debates? No. All right. I should also mention too that protectionism is gonna be on the rise, but I think I mentioned that already. Started in Europe where they started reintroducing tariffs mm -hmm. as, and, and, and reducing, um, uh, what's it called? Free trade. Uh, there was a couple economic crashes in Europe that caused them to sort of back off on free trade. And the same thing that occur here in the United States. Because again, if you're operating with free trade and everyone else starts putting on tariffs, it's like it almost forces you to also put up tariffs. Because otherwise, you can't, you can't sell to anybody, but you can buy their stuff. So it becomes a problem. So I, sh I should say we also have the return of protectionism. <clears throat> Tariffs. In response to Europe. All right, lastly, minority rights or lack thereof. So I already mentioned things like the black codes that made it easy to arrest poor whites and blacks, put them into prison, and hire them out as super cheap convict labor. And you also have, of course, with the removal of Union troops from the South. Uh, result in a higher amount of discrimination and violence against blacks with groups like the KKK because there's no law enforcement that's really standing up against it. Uh, but those are all obviously illegal or at least unethical. Well, no, this is unethical too, but this is one where the South tries to play a legal game. They say, okay, 14th Amendment, you have to have equality under the law and you also have to have um, uh, allow blacks the right to vote. So one thing they started doing, I mentioned this last time, was they started introducing literacy, literacy tests and poll taxes, which technically is equal because you're applying it to everybody. But they purposely did this so poor whites and blacks could not afford to vote or they couldn't pass the literacy tests to vote. So they tried passing it as like a, uh, it's equal, it's just that it's equally applied to everybody, it's just that it eliminates the people we dislike from voting, be it poor whites or blacks. You did it to poor whites as well? Yeah, yeah I mean, they might not enforce it on whites, which they're supposed to. Uh -huh. Like for example, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a racist white southerner and I'm running the poll and I see a white guy walk up, even if he's poor, if I'm, unless I'm trying to stop the poor, I just wouldn't apply the poll tax or literacy test. But if I see a, 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 an African American walk up, and I'm a racist white poll tax person, then I'm gonna apply the poll tax to him. Or is it each other? But it did. Mm -hmm. If they applied to everybody, it did also eliminate poor whites. But again, blacks were much more victimized by this. Okay. So those are legal. But one more clever but very unethical policy they tried applying was the old separate but equal policy in the South. These are known as Jim Crow laws. So Jim Crow laws are almost exclusively in the South, the Deep South specifically, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, et cetera. Um, these are laws that would apply the law equally but it's segregated people. So it's like, all right, you can all ride the train, except blacks have to sit in this car, right? So it was technically equal, you could buy a ticket, but you couldn't sit in the same spot. Or maybe you had to give up your seat for a white person, which isn't equal, but, or they segregated restaurants, they segregated public facilities like parks or drinking fountains or whatever. Um, and they tried to claim legality on this, actually won it in a case versus, called named Plessy versus Ferguson, in 1896. I believe this one was over rail cars. They were forcing black pastors to do a rail car and they challenged it and, and the government basically said, the Supreme Court basically said, well, you can still use the train, so it is okay to be separated, segregated, as long as the facilities and treatment are equal. So they tried saying the railroad cars are equal, they just keep them separated, and that made, uh, that legalized Jim Crow and, and the, the the phrase that sort of follows that is separate but equal. So equal, equal application to, of law, but they are, are allowed to legally segregate um, if their state wants to. So a lot of southern states and cities do, uh, and many northern and western cities do not. They still do some, but not like in the south. Separate but equal. So again, 
It's like a legality issue where, again, they're applying the 14th Amendment equal application of the law, except they're legally saying segregation is okay as long as it's equal. So we have schools, railroads, parks, restaurants, etc., that have uh, colored uh, seats or white-only seats or whatever, and they would segregate them. So first, by the way, civil rights leaders attacked the equal part because it turns out that, big shock, many of the facilities weren't equally created. So like the, um, the white version, like the white drinking fountain might be a better drinking fountain than the black, uh, the colored only drinking fountain or whatever, or bathrooms or rail cars. So they attacked that first and they also proved that keeping them separated meant that they were inherently unequal because they don't have the access to the same facilities or teachers or opportunities. So that's later though, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. So from roughly the 1880s and 90s, to the mid 20th century, we have in the South a firmly planted set of Jim Crow laws that are legally backed by Plessy versus Ferguson, saying that it is okay to segregate as long as the facilities are equal.